I'm Peter Ernest, the executive director of the museum, and I will be moderating this evening. And so I will ask uh, each of our speakers to give an overview of, uh, of his experience, any principal points he wants to make with you. Uh, we'll start with uh, Juan Zarate, and uh, then go to Phil Mudd. Juan Zarate is currently a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which held a panel yesterday, I believe, celebrating the 10th anniversary of this office of monitoring financial controls. He's a senior national security analyst for CBS News and a visiting lecturer of law at the Harvard Law School and a national security consultant. He currently has his own consulting firm. I'll let him give you the name of that uh, and any other information you may want. He served as the deputy assistant to the president and deputy national security, security advisor for combating terrorism from 2005 to 2009. And he was the first Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for terrorist finance, financing and financial crimes. He is the author of Treasury's War, the Unleashing of a New Era of Financial Warfare. And I understand both of you will stay for a bit afterwards and sign your books. No. You're not prepared no. to sign your books. <laughs> Can we give them away? <laughs> As long as they Starting pay. on a serious <laughs> note here. Okay. Uh, the book itself, Juan's book, it focuses on the transformation of the Treasury's Department of Financial Sanctions tools into some of the most important instruments of national power. So that said, uh, please help me welcome Juan Zarate. Peter, it's a pleasure and honor to see you again. Thank you for hosting this event. Um, it's good to be here with a, a real spy and another real spy. Um, <laughs> it is a real honor to be here again, Peter, at the Spy Museum. I want to thank everybody here and all of you for attending. Good afternoon. Uh, it's also a deep pleasure to be with Phil Mudd, um, all joking aside, one of uh, the great American patriots of this era uh, and somebody I'm honored to call a, a close friend. Um, and so uh, anything he has to say, I would listen to. I don't agree with everything he has to say, so we'll, we'll go through that uh, a little bit later. But he's a, he's a true American hero uh, and one of the great uh, intelligence professionals of this era. So um, I'm really honored that he's here uh, and would recommend his book highly. Um, what I thought I'd do is just give a quick overview, maybe set the stage for a bit of our discussion about the role of financial intelligence and financial power uh, in the 21st century. Because all you have to do is look at the newspaper or the headlines to understand that financial power and in influence has in many ways taken pride of place in our national security. The whole question of how we influence or affect Russian behavior in the context of the Ukraine is centered around how we impose financial sanctions and costs on the Russian economy in a way that affects behavior or deters further Russian adventurism. If you look at the question of how we're negotiating with Iran and using leverage to uh, affect their nuclear decision making, the calculus as to whether or not they'll develop a nuclear program or move toward weaponization. That centers around whether or not we can use economic power and influence and how we unwind that in the negotiations. When you look at the question of how Al-Qaeda and terrorist groups have metastasized and localized and regionalized in places like East Africa or North Africa, South and Central Asia, there's a question of how we can use financial tools and influence to constrict their reach to ensure that they don't have access to resources and can't globalize their agendas. And so issue after issue, national security uh, debate after debate, the question of how we use financial power and influence to constrict the ability of America's enemies to access resources, to use the financial and commercial system to their advantage, is now central to how we think about these issues. What I want to do, though, is talk a bit about the role of financial intelligence in that regard. I think it's important, given that we're here at the Spy Museum, to not only understand the strategic context, but to understand how financial intelligence has taken a principal role in this period as well. Because if you look at this period, what has emerged is a paradigm in how the U.S. has used its uh, economic power, the attractiveness of its capital markets, the primacy of the dollar as a way of 
leveraging power well beyond our borders to be able to ensure that terrorist fundraisers aren't able to access bank accounts, to ensure that the Revolutionary Guard of Iran isn't able to wire money uh, using international banks, to ensure that Office 39, the office that is used by the North Korean intelligence service to raise illicit capital, isn't able to use the global financial commercial system. There are, there's a paradigm, there's a playbook uh, that's, uh, that's been at play. And central to that playbook is the use of financial intelligence. Now, what is financial intelligence? Financial intelligence has always been with us. Financial information, in many ways, has always been with us. Um, in many ways, it's the traditional things that we think about, the information that banks provide to governments in terms of suspicious activity reporting or currency transaction reports. In the 70s and 80s and even the 90s, there was an emphasis in the intelligence community and law enforcement to look at financial criminal behavior of terrorist networks, drug trafficking cartels, uh, and even proliferation networks as they emerged. And understanding those networks under, by understanding their financial uh, infrastructure. You also had a, a very clear sense that uh, in understanding systemic risk, especially from a treasury perspective, you had to understand the vulnerabilities, for example, from money laundering. Uh, the major banks, banks like BCCI or the Bank of New York that was charged with uh, facilitating Russian organized crime money laundering, that those types of activities were isolated from the formal financial system and, and protecting uh, the financial world. And so in a sense, financial intelligence information has always been a part of how we've thought about the environment uh, writ large. But post 9-11, what happened was an extreme focus and emphasis on financial intelligence. In part, part of the broader focus on trying to understand the terrorist networks and enemies that were threatening the United States. Very much a part of the broad mosaic of trying to gather as much information about these networks as possible. And to understand these networks, one has to understand their financial underpinnings. How are they raising money? What vehicles are they using to raise and move money around the world? Do they have deep pocket donors in places like the Arabian Gulf supporting their causes? What front companies do they uh, use? Do they use shipping companies? How are they actually operating and using the implements of the global financial and commercial system to their benefit? And so it was this focus on financial intelligence, the ability to understand financial infrastructures, relationships, and ultimately financial trails and footprints uh, that became a, an extreme emphasis in the U.S. government. And I say extreme not because it, it was out of bounds, but because there was intensity of focus in a way that you hadn't seen before 9-11. Um, and it, an intensity in part because we realized that intelligence had to be used not just to understand the enemy, but to be able to disrupt and dismantle the networks uh, with which we were fighting. And that financial trails in many ways could provide not only a missing piece of the puzzle, but also a way to disrupt quite dramatically and emphatically uh, terrorist operations and networks. And so we started to understand in many ways that financial intelligence vis-a-vis -vis Al Qaeda and terrorist groups was an important part of the mosaic. But we also started to design new programs to gather more information because financial intelligence wasn't just the receipts found in the pockets of terrorists who were arrested in Afghanistan or Pakistan, and they weren't just the wire transfers between known terrorist operatives. They were the financial relationships among uh, those that were supporting terrorist groups. And so the Treasury Department, in many ways, began a new role in developing new forms of financial information and intelligence. The Treasury Department, for example, established a new program with the Global Communication and Banking uh, consortium called SWIFT, which was a new program to look at the global banking system and the information in it for terrorist suspect behavior and transactions. And so a new program was born, the Terrorist Financing Tracking Program, which took data selectively from SWIFT and analyzed it in ways to be able to understand relationships uh, that previously had been unseen. And what emerged in what was actually a very limited and constrained program were deep insights into how terrorists were beginning to operate. And so we saw, for example, the emergence of uh, networks tying Pakistani fundraising and activity 
with activity in commercial ventures in New York, rug businesses and others that were tied to the, to the Al-Qaeda infrastructure. We began to see traces and trails that we hadn't seen before. For example, the Southeast Asian Al-Qaeda operative Hambali, who was responsible for their anthrax program, was ultimately found in part because of financial trails and links to facilitators helping him hide in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, if you recall, Phil. Oh, yeah. And so new programs emerged and started to prove the value of financial intelligence in some very important ways that tied to the work that Phil and others were doing in other realms. And new offices were born around the intelligence community and importantly, at the Treasury Department. And so this new Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence that was born on 2004 purposely had financial intelligence in the title because for the first time in history, the Treasury Department, the Finance Ministry of the U.S. government, created an Office of Intelligence and Analysis in it. The only such finance ministry in the world that has an intelligence function embedded in its operations. And this was part of a new approach how to use financial intelligence and financial power and tools to attack the financial underbelly of America's enemies. And this had enormous values. It gave deep insights into networks that had previously been unseen, networks that demonstrate uncommon or unorthodox connections or nexus between actors that you wouldn't otherwise imagine. So for example, the Treasury Department, the DEA revealing just a couple of years ago that Hezbollah not only had relationships with South American drug traffickers because of the financial links, but they also were using financial relationships and transactions with used car dealers in the United States to hide some of their transactions and money. And the relationships with a bank called Lebanese Canadian Bank to launder hundreds of millions of dollars that eventually found its way back into Beirut and into the hands of Hezbollah. And so networks and relationships emerge in a way that you would not otherwise imagine. And it allows you then to see evolutions of these networks, the evolution of what we call for-profit militancy, groups like the Haqqani Network in Pakistan uh, engaging in criminality to raise and move money, groups that are tied to Al-Qaeda. Groups like Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb beginning to develop new forms of financing and relationships because of their smuggling networks and kidnap for ransom operations. The ability of groups like Al-Shabaab to develop new money laundering operations like uh, trade-based money laundering and the export of charcoal and the import of sugar, believe it or not, into East Africa as a way of raising money and the connections to the business and diaspora communities as a result. And so financial intelligence in many ways gives you a, a new vantage point, a new mosaic to understand these networks, to understand their operations their resources, and also their vulnerabilities. It also gives opportunities for disruptions, and those vulnerabilities become important. I remember in the early days after 9-11, before we even created this Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, Kofor Black, who was then the, the chief of the counterterrorism uh, center at the CIA, coming into the Treasury Department, I think for the first time in his career, and in talking to Kofor, this is a, an anecdote in the book, uh, Kofor said that he expected to see a bunch of accountants running around Treasury with green eye shades and, uh, and calculators in their hands. Um, and what Kofor was coming over to do was to help coordinate how we were going to use financial information and tools to not only expose but potentially disrupt an entire network in Europe that was being used to raise money for Al Qaeda, and in part to coordinate what could be used publicly and would not be used publicly. And so you saw a new emergence of disruption activities around financial intelligence that in many ways had Treasury at its core. You also had this financial intelligence in a very interesting way starting to serve as a catalyst for our financial diplomacy. And so in a, the ability to not only expose rogue or illicit actors from the, from the, uh, the legitimate financial world, but also to convince actors in the international system, namely banks and also non-bank financial institutions, to stop doing business with rogue or suspect actors. That was driven by financial intelligence. And so I tell stories in the book about how the undersecretary of this new Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence 
went on a roadshow around the world with dossiers, financial intelligence and information, about what the Iranian Revolutionary Guard was doing to raise, move, and hide money around the world. And importantly, he shared that information with finance ministry and foreign ministry counterparts. But perhaps most importantly, he shared that information with bank CEOs, general counsels, and compliance offices. And that information, that dossier, would explain not only what the Revolutionary Guard was doing, but how they were hiding and masking their operations. And it allowed then the financial diplomats, the Treasury officials on these roadshows, to ask the fundamental question, do you know your customer? Do you know what's flowing in and out of your bank or your institution? Can you reasonably say that you know what's happening with these Iranian customers? And if the answer is no, then you have to cut off your relations with that, that institution or those customers. That's precisely what started the constriction campaign against Iran. It's precisely why the Iranian economy has suffered so much isolation. It's in part because the private sector, through the catalyst of financial intelligence, decided it was not worth the risk to do business with Iran. And that started the constriction campaign, the campaign that has brought Iran to the table. You've seen that kind of information used against North Korea with the isolation of Banco Delta Asia, a key bank used by the North Koreans for a range of illicit activity in Macau. The North Koreans are known as the mafia state, the criminal state, sometimes called the Soprano state because they actually like the Sopranos. They have the DVD set. Um, and financial intelligence was used to expose the activities of this bank and the underlying illicit activity of the North Koreans. And so the fact that the North Koreans are engaged in drug trafficking, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, could be exposed. The fact that they were engaged in proliferation deals, recall they were behind the Syrian program that was ultimately destroyed by the Israelis, engaged in uh, high order cigarette uh, smuggling and counterfeit. So the tobacco companies chase the North Koreans around the world. And importantly, a range of money laundering activities and counterfeit. The best counterfeit of US $100 bills in the world coming from North Korea. So much so that the Secret Service calls it the super note. And so financial intelligence allowed for the exposure of this bank, the exposure of the financial facilitation, and the exposure of what the North Koreans were doing in the international banking system. And it led to the first time in modern memory the North Koreans to call the White House and the State Department first to say, we have to talk. And ultimately, their negotiator telling the US, you finally found a way to hurt us. We need our money back. And finally, the military has found a very interesting way of thinking about and using financial intelligence and information. The military actually calls it something different. The military always wants its own doctrine and own lexicon. They call it threat finance. And the military now has taken on the doctrine of threat finance, understanding how America's enemies, those who are intending to do harm to our men and women in uniform, those intending to challenge the US militarily, gain resources. And to understand that then is then to understand the ability to disrupt those activities. It's why in Baghdad there was born something called the Iraq threat finance cell in the mid 2000s to understand how the insurgents and how Al Qaeda and others who were fighting our forces and the Iraqi troops were resourcing themselves. It's why a similar Afghan threat finance cell manned not just by the military, but by the DEA and Treasury and others was built in Afghanistan to look at the range of money laundering and illicit financial activities happening in Afghanistan, much of which is fueling the fight against our troops and Afghan forces. And so this is a period of not just deep reliance on financial tools and influence in our national security. And again, you can see this over and over again in the national security debates at play. But it's also, also a period where we've seen the zenith in the use and the application of financial intelligence and one that has been a complement to our intelligence community to date, uh, an amplifier to what our law enforcement community does internationally, a tool to give teeth to our diplomacy around the world, the ability to arm our regulators and enforcement officers to man the gates of the financial system, and ultimately a new power to influence the isolation 
of rogue actors around the world. And so when you think about the ability to attack America's enemies, you now have to think about Treasury's war, and you have to think about the use of financial tools and influence, and particularly financial intelligence in that battle. And so I think we're in a new era, one where financial intelligence is paramount to how we understand America's enemies and how we actually disrupt those activities. Thank you. That was fascinating, Juan. All I did was write down a whole bunch of questions. Uh, <laughs> That's good. I, I was fascinated. You said when Kofor Black went to, uh, over to the Treasury, he expected to see a bunch of people running around with calculators and green eye shades. You never said what he did see. So <laughs> at some point. That's uh, classified. <laughs> okay, we want to address that. But it is very, and, and clearly, you're, you're making a point here, and I imagine Phil probably will come back to it. This is all driven since 9-11. I mean, uh, because I remember there was a degree of, you know, follow the money was part of what we thought about in the agency, but never to the degree that you're describing it here. You want me to answer? I'm happy to, sure, to address it. Ahead. No, I, I, yeah. I think absolutely. I th I, there's no question that people thought about these issues before 9-11 and in many ways applied the, the, the notion of following the money to understand criminal networks, uh, uh, proliferation networks and to try to then affect them. But what happened post 9-11 was the centrality of the notion that we had to use all elements of national power and all elements of information and intelligence to understand the threats we were facing and to disrupt them. And it was both the, the function of the centrality of financial power and intelligence as a core doctrine, plus the notion that we're, we need to use that information to actually disrupt. It had to become actionable. It was those two functions that set in motion the revolution of financial intelligence. And it's why now you look at the spectrum of types of intelligence, human intelligence, human, signals intelligence, SIGINT. You now have financial intelligence at the table consistently, not as an ancillary part of what we do, but as a central function of the intelligence community and the Treasury Department. Let me, I, I want to come back. I, I do have some other questions I do want to come back to, but let me go ahead and introduce Phil Mudd. Uh, and I should say just by f before going on, I mentioned a couple of titles that uh, Juan Zarate held. Juan was one of the founding fathers of what has happened in the Treasury Department. Juan was one of the people who conceived of using financial intelligence in the ways that he's describing. So we are hearing it from one of the people who actually got this activity underway and helped see it through until today. Thank you. So thank you, and we'll thank come you. back to that. And I'm going to return to the green eye shades yes. and calculators <laughs> question. Okay. Uh, next is Phil Mudd. Uh, Phil joined the agency, the CIA, as an analyst in 1985 and rose to become deputy director of the CIA's counterintelligence center. That was the primary center for dealing uh, uh, with, uh, with terrorism. He served on the NIC, the National Intelligence Council, as the deputy NIO, that's the principal intelligence officer for the Near East and South Asia. And at the establishment of the FBI's National Security Branch in 2005, he served as the branch's first ever deputy director. Now mind you, he's CIA, and going over to the FBI and serving in that office was quite a distinction, both uh, because of the creation of the office and the acceptance by the FBI of a CIA officer in that position. <coughs> he later became the FBI's CIA intelligence advisor. He too has, uh, has uh, been at the writing table, the author of Takedown, Inside the Hunt for Al-Qaeda, an, an account of how the FBI and CIA tracked terrorism and sought to take down Al-Qaeda which is a matter of some discussion today as to the extent to which either it, it has or has not been taken down, which I hope you address, Phil. So please help me welcome Phil Mudd. On your last point, let me come to the chase. We did a terrific job, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Chris is taking a lot of... Grace. Grace? is taking a lot of notes that makes me really nervous. <laughs> What's that? Uh, yeah, I've heard Make that Make him before. nervous, it's okay. 
So we're going to make grace for the next 10 minutes at the center of a conspiracy. <laughs> and then we'll let you off the hook. For almost 10 years, every night we met at CIA, every night with Director Tennant. And I did the briefing of what you saw on TV is referred to as the threat matrix. What threats we had coming into the United States, somebody calling in, for example, or somebody emailing a CIA website saying there's going to, a bomb going to go up tomorrow. And they might be referring to Grace. I hope not, but I possibly. For the, for the purposes of the next 10 minutes, Grace was in the sights. You're finished. <laughs> and then I transferred over in 2005 to the FBI, and unfortunately, FBI Director Mueller, Juan, Juan will appreciate this, called us in at about 7.15 in the morning. And to get your briefing book and prep, that means you got to be in at about 6.45 and get a cup of coffee. So th this... The CIA went a bit later in the evening. The FBI started a bit earlier in the morning. But it was the same rhythm. You would say, what are the threats coming across the transom? And how do we ensure that nothing bad happens in Columbus, Ohio, or Washington, DC, or Fairfax, Virginia, <clears throat> or Memphis, Tennessee? How do we make sure nothing bad happens? So for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to explain why we did that and how we did it with a bit of an emphasis on the financial side. But I want to start with that simple mission statement. We're going to walk into the room in 60 seconds, and our mission is quite simply, how do we ensure that bad things don't happen in an open society with 330 million people? OK. Game on. It's 7.15 AM. Briefer walks in. All of us, about 10 of us around the table. You can be the FBI director. You're at the head of the table. It's a conference room table. And the operators come in and say, this is what we got overnight. And typically, we would be going down to see the attorney general in about 45 minutes. I saw three attorneys general in my time. And we would be talking about the major plots in America. So there might be 20 going on at once, but we'd be focusing on the high-end top three. That is, people who had the capability and the will to blow up something like the U.S. Capitol every day, 10 years of that crap. So if you see why I'm going over to Zaitinia, which is a Lebanese restaurant afterwards for a cocktail, now you know why. <laughs> it's mostly Grace's fault. <laughs> <laughs> so whether you're at the agency or the bureau, and they're very different organizations, you have a simple question. What you saw in the newspapers you read was a lot different than what I saw. I was seeing stomach stuff come across my table that you would see the next day, but the lives we lived were very different. You saw plots. You would see a headline that says, I remember this clearly, uh, some of the first threat reporting I saw in the spring of 2002, banks are under threat. The financial district in New York is under threat. Airlines are under threat. Anthrax is a threat. You saw the threats. I saw the people. You can stop threats as much as you want, but in my world, the people who are responsible for conspiring to commit that attack, if you stop the threat, if, for example, you secure the financial district in New York, those people are already over the edge. The conspirators that I faced every day will go back and find something else to attack. So while you saw headlines about threats, what I witnessed was if we stop that threat, we still have to find the people responsible for it because they will go back and recreate a conspiracy. I lived in the t people business. So let's start with Grace in the people business. In 2005, I witnessed, and this was an eye-opener, not only as a, uh, as a CIA officer and as an intelligence professional, but as an American citizen, I witnessed my first FBI threat briefing, 7.15 in the morning, Okay, I got to tell this story. This is irrelevant, but it's so funny. The Bureau, the, the CIA, especially under George Tenet, the director, is a very flat organization. So I would go in, I swear to you, George Tenet would be flat on on his sofa yelling at me about something. And I was about a couple levels below him, but still, I saw him every day, sometimes two, three times a day, very informal, a lot of four-letter words. He's a Mediterranean individual, again, the former CIA director. That would not happen at the FBI. The CIA is difficult to manage, but flat and agile. The FBI is easier to manage, maybe a little bit less slightly agile. 
But um, we would have conversations about what was going on every day. And those conversations would center on people. And here's why. So again, 2005, the first threat brief I saw at the FBI. It's 7.15 in the morning. We have 10 people around the, the table, and the briefer walks in and says, we've received information from a foreign intelligence service, that is an intelligence service, in this case in Europe, that one of their bad guys is up, up on email with somebody in the United States. And this happens to be a security service who was chasing bad guys who were the worst of what we saw in this case in 2005. In other words, we might have 98% of what I witnessed that was either interesting or chaff. And then at the 2%, the highest level, that is game on. Somebody who's, for example, received training from Al Qaeda and who wants to blow up the US Capitol. That is a serious problem. So in this case, we're dealing with a security service who's chasing someone who's already been, tr been trained by Al Qaeda. And that person is communicating, in this case, with a kid in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, if you want to sit up in your chair for 10 years, deal with 98% trash threat reports, and then have somebody walk in, and this was fairly common, and say, one of our friends in Europe picked up a guy in Atlanta talking to one of their really nasty boys who's been trained by Al Qaeda in Pakistan. I don't care how long you're in this business, and I did it for 25 years. That'll make you sit up. So what do you do? What do you do? Your first question, and there are two basic questions you face. Now, you don't face these questions because in a minute, you're going to be part of the conspiracy. Most of you are guilty of a federal violation, whether you know or not, for the purposes of this evening. So I'm on the other side from you. I'm chasing you. What are the two questions you face? The first is imminent threat. Does this person have the will and the capability to kill somebody tonight? It's funny, one of the things I noticed since I, I, I didn't resign from government, I quit for a variety of reasons. I quit, I just said, I'm done, here's my badge, I'm out of here. I, I didn't quite realize when I was in, my friends who are teachers, my sister's a teacher, my other sister's a college professor in biochemistry, I have a sister as an artist. I have a brother as a prosecutor. My best friend's in finance. I realized that I didn't quite understand the intensity of spending, especially the last 10 years of my career, facing people whose job in life was to kill innocent civilians. And I'm still sort of in the 10-step recovery program. <laughs> but the responsibility in that case, when that threat briefing comes in, is does this person have the will or capability to kill somebody tonight? Because that person, by the way, I'm not making this up, Haris Ahmed, Atlanta, Georgia, he was a student at Georgia Tech. I can say all this because the case has been prosecuted. That person, if he picks up an AK-47 and goes to a mall in Atlanta, Georgia, is going to bring tragedy in this country that I can never live down. What do you say the next day? What do you say to the American people in, in, in a congressional hearing, and I did a million congressional hearings, if they say, you guys went up live on him yesterday, Tuesday, or what's today, Wednesday, Thursday, I can't Thursday. even, Thursday. Thursday, Wednesday, whatever. Wednesday, you knew he was a bad guy, and he shot up a mall tonight. Can you imagine? So your first question is, is he gonna do something tonight? And that breaks down into what I said, capability intent. Does he have weapons? Does he have explosives? Does he have a storage shed that has weapons or explosives? Is he talking to friends about doing something tonight? The first questions I asked are capabilities. Does he actually have a weapon or explosive? The second is tougher, it's intent. Is he telling his friends he wants to do something? Okay, let's stop for a moment and consider those and then transition to the real story. But let's stop at the first part. What's gonna to happen tonight and can I confirm that he's not gonna kill 20 people in a shopping mall? That's a digital story. Visa credit card, does he rent a storage shed? I don't need an agent to investigate that. I'm gonna investigate what his credit card says. Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, does he have a weapons license? Has he purchased explosives? AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, is he up on email talking to somebody in a way that suggests he's gonna do something tonight? 
you realize where you were as co-conspirators 15 years ago did not give me the capability to collect your electrons and understand whether you're going to do something tonight. In 2014, most of you are texting, you're emailing, you're doing deposits electronically. I'm an idiot and I deposit electronically. You're making travel arrangements electronically. Within 24 hours, I can answer the questions about whether you have weapons, explosives, a storage shed, and what you're talking about in your email so that I can cross off the box of whether you're going to do something tonight. Grace, we're cool. You're not ready to go yet with your huge conspiracy here. We're not going to take you down yet. So when somebody walks in, as they did to me in September of 2005, and says, you have a kid at Georgia Tech researching, by the way, how to build an explosive device, this is an engineering student, on a university computer, within a day or two, I can tell you, based on electrons, I don't think he has weapons or explosives yet. I don't think he's storing them, and I don't think he's talking about doing something imminently, but he is talking to some nasty boys. So that's the second part of the story, and that's where Juan comes in. If you're involved in that kind of an investigation, you can ask yourself a simple question. Has Grace done something that we've uncovered in the 24 to 48 hours that we're investigating this case that means she could spend her life in federal detention? Very simple law enforcement question. Can I quickly determine whether Grace has committed a federal violation related to terrorism that means we are going to throw away the key? The answer is yes. The answer is irrelevant. If you look at the co-conspirators in this room, what we focused on and why what Juan did was important is if Grace goes down tonight in a bust operation and we leave the conspiracy out in Atlanta or Chicago or in this case London, South Asia, Northern Europe, and the Balkans, that conspiracy will recreate itself because the people who are involved in the conspiracy will lay low while Grace's prosecution proceeds, and in a year they'll say, we still believe what we believe, and they missed us. So what do we do? We ask ourselves a series of about eight questions. For those of you who took anatomy, physiology, biology in high school, I don't even remember if you still have textbooks, but if you do, back in the day, you would get an anatomy, physiology textbook that had transparent pages that would allow you to see what the human body looked like. Transparency one, bones. Transparency two, veins. Transparency three, muscles and tendon. And by overlaying those, you got to get a picture of what the human body looked like. So now it's day three in our investigation. And Juan knows this well, having worked with Director Mueller, he's gonna start to say, forget about whether Grace is vulnerable to a federal prosecution, is there a broader conspiracy here that if we don't take it out, will threaten another city? So we're gonna do those transparent overlays. Question one, who does she talk to? That's email, that's text, that's phone, that's digital. In every step I take, think about how much shoe leather you would spend on the question 25 years ago and how much shoe leather you would have to spend today. This is the Edward Snowden conundrum. Text, email, phone, no shoe leather. Question two, where has Grace traveled 
travel in my old world was more significant than you can imagine because if a conspirator touched a foreign terrorist, the capability of that conspirator escalated quickly. Grace alone, I don't want to be disrespectful, but the individual terrorists I followed, if they never touched somebody who was a pro in the game, they'd make mistakes. As soon as they traveled and touched a pro, for example, their operational security would jack up and I would have a much harder time following them. Fast forward, worst plot, this is go, again going back to 2005, worst plot I ever saw at the FBI, 06, 07, the conspirators had trained overseas. They were so good that they didn't speak on the phone, they didn't email, they didn't text, and they didn't talk in public. They went into a large public park and went face down on the dirt so that we couldn't lip read them. That's pretty damn good. That's a problem. So what I'm saying is I focus on travel because they learn that not by themselves. They learn that when they touch a foreign terrorist. So email, phone, text, travel. <coughs> I want to know what you bought. That's Visa. That's Amazon, that's Google. I want to know if you bought beauty supplies because that's what you're going to do to, to simmer down a backpack bomb. You're going to take beauty supplies, which are potentially explosive, if you've been trained by Al Qaeda and you're make, going to make the same backpack bomb that took out the subway in London in 2005. So now think about that physiology textbook with the transparent overlays. Without picking up a finger except to deliver a piece of paper to the phone company, which is going to be really irritated that for the thousandth time we want all their documents. I've gotten a picture of who you texted, who you called, who you emailed, where you traveled, what you ordered. And I'm only touching the surface. And what else do I want to know, Grace? You want, she wants to leave now. She's like, I really, I'm not in for this. <laughs> yes, that's, sorry. Federal marshals in the back, handcuffs. <laughs> I want to know who paid. And the reason is not really the money. I want to know who paid for you to travel. I want to know who paid for your explosives. I want to know what your salary is and when you have unusual transactions that don't reflect your salary. I want to know the pattern of ATM withdrawals and whether they relate to anything you've done. Are you withdrawing 400 bucks every Friday? Why? And I want to know who you're paying, Western Union. Did you transfer money to somebody? And it's not because I want to know about 400 bucks. It's because if I take you down and I don't take the rest of the spider web down, that spider web will reconstitute itself. So let me close here. It's 2005 and it's the digital era and everybody in this conspiracy in this room is vulnerable. You're vulnerable because somehow you touched grace because you're a co-conspirator. And now, in the digital world, I'm going to say, without putting shoe leather on the ground, I want to map the network. And I'm going to say, you called her. Who are you? I'm going to say, you texted her. Who are you? I'm going to say, she traveled to your house. Who are you? I'm going to say, she ordered Domino's pizza. We face this one. Are you a Domino's employee? Or are you a co-conspirator? And I'm going to say, in an effort to map this conspiracy, you sent her money, you took her money. Why? Because when I walk in the room at 7.15 on Friday, I'm going to say, Director, we got a call. That call told us that our friends in Europe are chasing a nasty boy. And that nasty boy called Haris Ahmed or Grace or emailed. And now, within the space of 72 hours, based on their calls and their emails and their purchases and their travels and their money, 
Here's who they are. And the next step is we're going to take them out. That's what I did. So let's go to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. A very vivid description of what it's like at the working level. Now, remind me, you are a consultant to? I work at Southern Sun Asset Management. We do big money in Memphis, Tennessee. So if you want to make big money, take my card and like pension funds and okay like you are that. also uh, a consultant I speak I write I um, to one of the media uh, I do yeah well tomorrow morning or this morning at 8 it was CNN tomorrow morning 905 we'll do Fox which if you want to talk about media that's fun that'll go ugly I predict if you watch Fox at 908 tomorrow it's gonna go nasty <laughs> okay they're all that's later than they're all later than 715 <laughs> <laughs> I only did media at the Bureau when the public affairs okay. guy told me. But let me throw out what has to be a question. Uh, you, you opened the door to this, Phil, so I'll blame you in part. Could you individually please give a reaction, uh, uh, you're both out of government now, to the Snowden affair? Juan? Well, you know, there, there's so many aspects to it that you could, we could spend the whole session on this, but I think the effect, and I'm, I'm particularly yeah. interested in the effect, if we listen to Phil, yeah. so much of that was about communications. Yeah. What is the effect now of what Mr. Stoughton has done and may still do? Well, I think in the, in the first instance, the, the notion, uh, as he articulated in his interview the other night, that there's no uh, demonstrated effect based on the revelations is just preposterous. Um, one need only look at the facts. Um, and you may not want to believe what our intelligence professionals tell us, but there's no question across the board that they've told us that the terrorists that we're tracking, the very folks that Phil uh, was mentioning, have altered the way that they communicate uh, and are not using certain means and modalities precisely because of the revelations. And so um, that's a reality. And you, we, we may want to sugarcoat it. We may want to say, look, it's worth the debate that we're having publicly, but there's a real cost and consequence to the revelations. There's also a cost um, to the private sector. Uh, American companies now are suffering as a result of having cooperated, having responded to subpoenas, having responded to the process. They're now being penalized internationally uh, with respect to this. There's no question that our diplomacy has been hurt. The state visit uh, uh, stopped and, and canceled uh, with Brazil, for example. The tension with Germany at a time where that relationship's critical, given what's happening in Europe and with respect to Russia. Um, you go down the line, the costs and consequences of the revelations are uh, self-evident. And I think uh, to suggest that there, there weren't costs is to deny the facts. Um, I do think there's a broader strategic impact to the revelations in addition to uh, you know, our enemies sort of adjusting to now what they understand to be our capabilities. Um, one of them is that it has reshaped the debate. If you recall at the time that the Snowden uh, leaks happened, there was a lot of, uh, and a much more open debate about Chinese and Russian uh, cyber espionage. Uh, the U.S. government began to actually talk about it and issue reports. Recall that the DNI began to speak openly about that. That debate changed almost overnight. And uh, instead of moral equivalency between what the Chinese and Russians uh, are doing in terms of cyber espionage and, and cyber infiltration uh, began to emerge with what Snowden was revealing. Uh, the other thing I would mention in terms of the costs on research and development, those have been enormous. And the reality is that um, if Snowden had just been uh, interested in sparking a debate about privacy and civil liberties with respect to uh, purported domestic spying, uh, programs, he could have taken a handful of documents. Instead, he downloaded documents that he did not have a right to, to access, uh, uh, you know, coerced or um, hoodwinked uh, fellow employees to give him access and passwords that he, he didn't uh, have access to, and downloaded thousands of documents that actually have nothing to do with purported domestic uh, collection, but instead military intelligence capabilities. And so I just think across the board, it's been disastrous. Now, it is a fair and honest appraisal as well to say, look, it has sparked a debate about what that balance is between collection 
an aggressive collection, as uh, Phil described, um, and privacy and civil liberties. Uh, but that's a debate that should be sparked by the executive, by the FISA court, by our congressional representatives, by the media, um, not by a single individual who's taken it upon himself to download thousands of documents and do damage to American national security. And so I don't think he's a whistleblower. I don't think he's a patriot. He, he's a criminal and should face justice. Okay, thank you. What would you add to that, Phil? <clears throat> to the chase, if he had stopped after a week, and I, I confess I'm an outlier in the intelligence community, I would have said he probably should still be prosecuted, but that's not a bad debate. The American, you know, I'm not a, I, I, I when I do public <clears throat> forum, people sort of think that if you're a CIA officer, you somehow lose your Americanness, which is absurd. I think the conversation, I think the fact that the American people know at some level, although I think the debate is really, uh, I think the facts get really obscured in this conversation, know that a lot of their emails and phones are picked up, I don't think that's bad. The problem is the, what he said in the year or whatever it's been after the first week. I mean, why are you talking about the G7? Why are you talking about what we do in Latin America? I think he could have sparked a very valuable debate. Valuable debate. He would have still been vulnerable to prosecution if he had just said, they steal, or that's not the right word. That's my old life. They collect, <laughs> sorry, a lot of your email and phone. Um, I, I, I think there has been damage. I think the government gets a little bit hyperventilating about this. I think there have been, has been damage, but not about the revelation that a lot of phone and emails get vacuumed up. I mean, really? I spent years listening to terrorists on the phone and email, watching the reports come in, and talking to my officers who were interrogating terrorists at our CIA black sites. I confess I was involved in that program. So I'm going to go to a terrorist and say, excuse me, do you know we're actually pretty good at listening to phone calls and emails? And they're going to be like, oh, really? I didn't think about that. Damn it. I better get off the email. My point is the first revelation is a little painful, but I think, think they would have been valuable for the national debate. The, the next 99%, I'm like, you really, I think he was stupid. And I, I don't, I confess, I think he's sort of naive. I kind of feel bad for him in some ways. He got bad counsel. There's a valuable, valuable debate to be had, and he obscured it by everything else he did. But you ought to know what we take of your stuff. And you ought to tell your congressman I'm comfortable with it or not. That's fine. Can I disagree just a little bit with Yeah, that? please. Okay. Come on. Yeah. This is intentional, by the way. It's an intentional <laughs> verbal conflict. I can step off the platform. No, this is good. No, no. Uh, I disagree with, with the premise that, you know, the, the, the terrorists know what we're doing. Of course they know that we're trying to listen to them. Of course they know that we're trying to understand their financial relationships. But they don't know how we're doing it. I mean, this was the argument made in 2006 when the terrorist financing tracking program was revealed by the New York Times, when everyone at the time that was justifying and apologizing for the revelation um, said, well, of course the terrorists know that you're looking at their financial trails. You talk about it all the time. It wasn't that they didn't know we were trying. is that they didn't understand the modalities, how we were actually doing it. Um, and those who suggested at the time that, oh, clearly everyone understood that SWIFT was being used um, was being disingenuous because they didn't. Um, and in fact, that's why it was a front page story in 2006, long after 9-11, because it was such an important program and so interesting and so different. Um, and by the way, the New York Times ombudsman, uh, public editor, later came out with a mea culpa uh, indicating that the support for the revelation of the program was mistaken and wrong. Uh, and I think that's right, uh, because I think some of these revelations um, in how they are revealed often are destructive to a more constructive debate. And an argument I make in the book, I made it in a New York Times op-ed uh, right after the Snowden leaks, is that the 2006 revelation of the way the New York Times couched it as a, an over-aggressive collection of financial information did a huge disservice because that program was actually built precisely with privacy and civil liberties concerns squarely in mind. Uh, the only intelligence program that I'm aware of that allowed the, the source of the information to actually control access to it. Uh, SWIFT actually in this program uh, could and I believe still can stop analysts in a real-time basis if there's non-compliance with the, the strict uh, rules on how that information is used and accessed and stored, um, and a whole host of other controls and audits and such. 
uh, so much so that the European uh, auditor on this has found on two occasions uh, that there's nothing wrong with it. So I, I think the, the way these things are revealed, the fact that there isn't an understanding of some of the nuance uh, often distorts the debate and you lose an opportunity to have a more honest debate about how you actually uh, want the government to understand enemy networks but where the limits should be. And I think we have to have that debate, but I don't think that debate should be spurred by a single individual taking upon himself mm -hmm. to reveal thousands of documents uh, on his own. I didn't elect him to do that. I elected the president and we've elected our representatives to make those choices for us. And if that's not the right system, then we need to have that debate. But I didn't elect this guy to make that decision for all of us. Okay, I sense there's some questions out in the audience. Why don't we, uh, and if you'd be kind enough to wait for the mic, everybody can hear your question. Laura, right here in front. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Um, this is for either one of you, gentlemen. <laughs> if it's hard, it's his. <laughs> We now have five former detainees running around Cotter. Assuming our drones don't take them out like they did the guys in <laughs> Yemen, how, how can y'all, <laughs> our government, if we have the will and the way to not only track these guys, and this is assuming they're even going to be there for a whole year, and see who they're interfacing with, pull the plug on any resources they may have, and how are we going, because you know, you know they're gonna be gunning for Americans as soon as they possibly can. Um, how are we gonna try and mitigate this? Okay. Thank you. Anybody want to? Phil? Prep for your session tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> this will be fun on Fox tomorrow. Um, but let's bring some pain here. When you sit in that room at the NSC, National Security Council in, in, in the uh, White House, there are no good choices. The choices here was were let this keep rolling after the president has announced we're going to leave. So the Taliban sitting there saying, we got these guys. We got them. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying the Taliban guys aren't stupid. They're saying these guys are going to get out of here one of these days. That is the Americans. And you sit there and say, if we get out of there and don't take this guy home, I don't know, maybe they'll behead him. Think about a video, by the way. I, when I was in government, I always, you know, I didn't pay that much attention to media, frankly, but I always thought, what are the various scenarios? We're looking at one scenario, a guy was released. Here's a scenario I would have gamed. We pull out of negotiations, they behead him, and they, they publish the video. You want that debate in America? So let's put that aside, but my point is, you make decisions when you're dealt a hand of deuces. The deuces here are, we have very little leverage with the Taliban, and they're saying, Americans ain't got no leverage, we're gonna ask for five nasty boys. So let me now cut to the chase and answer your question. You're faced with that situation. If you think there's some secret answer, is, are there any media here? No. Okay. Oh, oh no, I can't be sure. We're all in the media, that's the problem. You signed a media release. Yeah. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> well, okay, let me adjust this a bit. Um, <clears throat> there's no secret behind the scenes uh, sense, I would wager, that we can secretly follow these guys. We made a deal with the devil because we had very few choices. If you think we're gonna implant a, a hearing device in their tooth, that dog don't hunt. That's not gonna happen. Now, if they make a mistake after they're released, not in gutter, but in Afghanistan, I was in the chair once, I'd shoot them with a, with a Predator missile. But um, I was listening today at people dancing around this in Washington, and one reason I was never in an elected position, I don't dance. They are not a risk. They will kill people. That's the choice we made, and I'd go back to where I started. We had few options and very little leverage. 
So we're not going to be able to follow them. They will go back to the fight. Clearly, in my judgment, the White House timed this to try to ensure that they don't get back to Afghanistan until most troops are withdrawn from the field. But 30 percent of the prisoners we released from mm. Gitmo, we can show, have gone back to the fight. So when you're in the chair, you sit there and say, you know, you take your chances and you make your bets, and none of the bets are good. So I look at this and say, I got it. Frankly, to be blunt, I would have made the same decision. And no, there's no risk, there's a certainty. Yeah, we can't follow them. Yeah, they're going to kill people. And yeah, we had to bring that kid home. Game over. Next problem. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> there's one right here, Amanda. Front. Thank you. How are you enforcing these rules? If you find the Lebanese Bank of Canada or whatever it was was doing something wrong, so they're in Canada. <laughs> Great question. Um, I answered in my book. Um, but you are just shameless. <laughs> That's true. That's why I wrote the book, to explain this. Um, if, if we had another hour, I, I would uh, go through this a bit more in detail. But the, the revolution in the post-9-11 period was in realizing how we could use America's financial power and influence well beyond our mm -hmm. borders to influence access to the financial system. So in the, in the Lebanese-Canadian bank context, I wasn't in government when this happened, um, what you had was not just the indictments brought by the Department of Justice and DEA, but you had the Treasury Department using a tool called Section 311 of the Patriot Act, which allowed the Secretary of the Treasury uh, to name the bank as a primary money laundering concern. And what that did was it allowed the Secretary of Treasury to then say, look, look, this is a problem bank, like the bank in Macau that I mentioned. Uh, it has done a number of things that threaten the financial system. Ergo, it needs to be cut off from the U.S. financial system. It can no longer have correspondent accounts. It can no longer clear dollars. It can no longer do business. And in the 21st century, in an interconnected global <laughs> system, with the American economy and capital markets being predominant, with the dollar being the chief reserve currency, that is a death penalty for a bank. And so the reach of American power is not just what we can touch on uh, in Wall Street, uh, because somebody has a bank building there, but it's the access to the dollar, it's the access to US capital markets, and the, it's the exclusion from that market that we control in many ways mm -hmm. that then gives us power well beyond our borders. And so the Lebanese Canadian bank has been basically neutered and destroyed. Not because we dropped a bomb on it, <laughs> not because we arrested their CEO, but because it cannot do business in the US. That's the difference in this period. And that's just the, the revolutionary change in how we have thought about the use of financial power. It's not how we hermetically seal a country with trade sanctions and align that with our diplomacy. That's still important in some ways. But it's how you exclude rogue and illicit actors from the financial system and do it strategically and with impact. And that's what's happened over the last 12 years. Right here, uh, Amanda, thank you. Given the power of the US over the world financial system, why have we done so little against Russia after their seizure of um, the Crimea and Eastern Ukraine? It's a great question. Um, and in some ways, you begin to see some of the limits of this power. And because in relying on the interconnected nature of the global financial system, you also have the reality that a major economy or power that has uh, the ability to bite back in some ways or to have a boomerang effect can in some ways shield itself from the mo most extreme or maximalist uh, efforts to financially isolate them. So in, in simple terms, you know, Russia and its economy is not Iran and not North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, and in many ways, we rely on Russia for all sorts of issues. And the economic and resource dependencies, oil and gas principally in Europe, are deep and very real. Um, European trade with Russia is about 10 times what uh, U.S. trade with Russia is. So the dependencies and the vulnerabilities in Europe are, are real. And so the U.S., I think, has taken that into account. You've seen this with the European Union. And what they've tried to do is, is something um, akin to a softer targeted campaign. That is to say, targeting individuals, some banks, Bank Rocio, namely, some institutions, um, to isolate and to, 
to sting the Russian economy. And also relying very much on the fact that the Russian economy has been weak and, and has grown weaker over the last year and a half. Uh, to try to spook the markets with the threat of additional sanctions. You've heard of these sector-based sanctions uh, that sit like an economic sword of Damocles over the heads of uh, the Russian uh, economy and, and actors. And so the idea is, can you make it a bit riskier, a bit costlier to do business in Russia without causing a major boomerang effect uh, that ultimately hurts the German economy or investment in London or uh, even U.S. interests. And so this is an attempt at a calibrated campaign to impose some costs, not in a maximalist way, but in a targeted, calibrated way that in some ways doesn't do damage um, to the European economy and in American interests. Okay. Uh, all the way in the back there, Amanda. Great program. Um, so, Juan, you talked a little bit about how uh, terrorists often use uh, SWIFT. SWIFT has now been exposed, and they're looking, presumably, for alternative ways of transferring money and that kind of thing. Can you talk a little bit about some of the alternative ways that they transfer money, Hawala systems and, and others, and how much visibility do we have about, uh, how much visibility do we have um, on those kinds of systems? And one in particular I'm kind of interested in, which is um, an Iranian system that goes directly into Lebanon. Thank you. Great seeing you, by the way. Um, for, first point of clarification, uh, SWIFT isn't um, a financial conduit like a bank. It's a, it's a bank messaging consortium. And so if you imagine kind of a, uh, a big switchboard that connects the messages between the banks around the world, that's what SWIFT is. And so SWIFT is basically the messaging system and board and backbone of the, of the system. What was so devastating in the Iranian context was that at the end of the constriction campaign, where Iranian banks, uh, insurance, transport was all unplugged from the global financial system, um, you had the European Union mandating that SWIFT no longer provide messaging services to those isolated and designated Iranian banks. And so in some ways, it was the last measure of unplugging the Iranian banks from that system. Um, which has been devastating. Uh, the, the entire campaign has been devastating. And it's why Rouhani, as you know, Toby, when they came back to the negotiating table, the first thing they wanted back was to be plugged back into the system, to have access to the banking facilities, to be able to finance the things that the Revolutionary Guard and the regime need finance both short and long term. Everything from uh, payments uh, and, and payment systems to long term infrastructure, for example. Um, and so the reality, though, as you've indicated, anytime you squeeze, money like water will find a way to flow. And these are smart actors. Um, you know, the Iranian uh, merchant class has found ways of doing business for centuries uh, in interesting ways. And so they've used bartering relationships uh, to raise and move money around the world. You've seen reports of the Turkish-Iranian deals around gold trade, uh, which has been very interesting, gold for oil, if you will. Um, you've seen terrorist actors, as a result of the squeezing, move to the use of cash couriers more aggressively. The Taliban, the Haqqani network, use the Hawala network, which is an informal use of brokers to move value and money around the world. Um, you've begun to see money, laundering, money launderers and drug traffickers use uh, digital currencies, for example, the Silk Road case uh, and the Liberty Reserve case, to the tune of billions of dollars of the use of digital currencies uh, to raise and move money for illicit purposes. And so the reality is the financial system and its, all its complexities, with its big banks that have had their failings, all the way to the informal ways of moving money to the tune of, um, of uh, millions of dollars, um, provide facilities for the creative actors to move money around the world. Um, and in many ways, what you see emerging as well is interesting networks and alliances of convenience or alliances of financial rogues, where the actors that have been isolated begin to help each other access capital and markets and insurance that they need to operate. Um, back to this gentleman's question. You know, the, the, the strategy in this period has been if you can impact the budgets of America's enemies, 
you can have long-term strategic impact. It's not the $400 transfer that Phil was talking about, but it's the ability to actually impact their strategic decision making. Can you make it harder, costly, or riskier for them to raise and move money around the world? And they here can be everyone from Al Qaeda or drug trafficking networks and Mexican cartels to the high order Iranian operations or Russian oligarchs that are uh, supporting the invasion of Ukraine. Good. Other questions? I wonder if you could just comment on the, on the emergence of these things like Bitcoin and other sort of forms of either currency or, as you say, digital means of exchange. In other words, we are arrayed, we are arrayed in opposing terrorist activity against some very, very bright people who have the means to employ other very, very bright people with green eye shades and calculators. How good are we? Are we able to keep it? Sounds like the sanctions against Iran have been among the best that have ever been brought against any country. Um, and, uh, and that's on the broad, on the, on the, on the broad sense of, of sanctions. Yeah. But how good are we against the terrorists individually? Because they're very creative, very imaginative. Even Phil described people you know, lying face down in Central Park and communicating. That's yeah. very hard to go up against. Yeah. There's no question there's constant innovation uh, among the targets that uh, we try to apply, whether it's uh, collection generally or uh, financial collection around. And, and so th they are creative in finding ways of doing business. And if there's money to be made, they, they will try to devise ways to, to make it, to move it, to hide it, to store it. Um, and that happens all the time. Um, I think we've grown very good at understanding how these systems work where the vulnerabilities lie and how these, these groups are operating. Uh, but I do think we've fallen short as an international community on the effectiveness of these tools. We know that there are billions of dollars of illicit capital that flow through the global uh, financial system uh, annually. Uh, and we also know that only a small fraction of that is either found or tracked or seized or frozen. Um, and so we do have to ask ourselves, are we effective at uh, not just understanding how this all works, but actually disrupting it. Now, very quickly on, on Bitcoin and digital currencies, um, f a fascinating innovation. Um, and in some ways, digital currencies are responding to inefficiencies in uh, the current system and new technologies that can address it. And so there are costs and friction in the current payment system, something the Federal Reserve admits openly and, and there are uh, moves to try to improve that. And so digital currencies, in some ways, um, lubricate the payment system in, in some ways. But it also uh, responds to the urge for greater privacy and anonymity. And so at the heart of uh, many of these digital currencies is the quest for anonymity uh, and autonomy and control of uh, financial transactions. Um, and so in some ways, the technology is responding to needs in the environment needs of individuals, needs of, of the financial system. Um, and the, the thing I worry about most with digital currencies is that they can provide not just dark alleys of financial activity for actors, but that they become a way for uh, previously less able actors to access capital, money, resources, and build networks in ways that they hadn't been able to in the past. Because ultimately, what you try to do strategically, if you're sitting in the White House, is can you do things to reduce the global reach, influence, and capabilities of America's enemies? And to the extent that digital currencies provide capital and access to those enemies, then you potentially have a danger. That said, <laughs> last caveat here, um, I do think uh, there are very interesting um, financial innovations as a result of digital currencies. And some great utilities that can be imagined in that regard. And it's why the US government isn't banning it. They are trying to regulate it. But it's also why state autocratic uh, regimes like China and Russia are much less comfortable with them and are seeking to either ban them or uh, push them offshore. Just one quick comment on that. Um, we're really good in one area, really good. And that is against the known. So if, if you are a conspirator and you make a mistake, you call the wrong person, you talk to the wrong person, you travel to the wrong place, you're gonna be in trouble. 
And what I witnessed, again, as an American citizen and a CIA officer who transferred to the FBI was, if you get in the FBI sites, stand back. You're in trouble. The challenge we face in the civil society, again, a reference to Snowden is, and I'm going to do me, you, as if we're adversarial. When I sat in the chair, what you expect is that we will never make a mistake and that we will never miss anything. And so the expectation is if there's a kid in Minneapolis, Minnesota, who's a Somali kid, and he buys a one-way ticket to Kenya, and he's looked at websites that are extremists, and he's talked to his friends about violence, and then he goes and kills somebody, you're going to say, why didn't you find him? And I'm going to say, can you explain to me what he just did that was illegal in a land that values free speech? And so what I felt on the inside was a pendulum. On the one case, you'd say, don't violate my American rights. On the other, you'd say, you better not make a mistake. So it wasn't the knowns I struggled with. I thought where we really faced a challenge was the balance between American expectations to make sure nothing bad happens at a shopping mall in Minnesota and making sure we protect people's rights. And it, it wasn't that I lost sleep or was troubled about it, but I do feel America is schizophrenic about this. What keeps you awake at night? Juan, you both served in the trenches. You in the Treasury Department, Phil, in dealing with terrorism at the at the one-to-one -one level. Yeah. What, do you, what concerns you most right now? You stepped out of government, and you were involved in one of the government's major efforts against terrorism. Well, when I moved to the, to the NSC in the White House um, and got to watch Phil's great work day-to-day, uh, -day, um, you, you worried about everything under the sun. But the, the, <laughs> the, 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 worst, the worst problem that we imagine, and this is when I took on the counterterrorism portfolio at the White House, um, was the blending of threats. That is to say, the ability of terrorists to get their hands on the most deadly of, of weapons or capabilities. Um, I would often worry most about the bioterror threat uh, and what terrorists might uh, ultimately seek to do. But I also worried about uh, the admixture of state and non-state proxies. And I continue to worry about this as a civilian and a citizen. Um, you know, how countries uh, decide to use proxies, both in the cyber domain and otherwise, to try to disrupt uh, and attack American vulnerabilities. And in the cyber domain, it's now sort of well understood, you know, we have very deep vulnerabilities in the financial space in terms of our infrastructure. Uh, and with a sophisticated enough campaign, uh, there is real danger to disruptions uh, to our national economy and our infrastructure. Uh, and in that regard, I worry about uh, the alliance of capable actors uh, with enough will, capacity, as Phil mentioned, uh, and opportunity uh, to actually do damage to the U.S. And so it's the convergence of some of the worst of the nightmares that actually uh, keeps me up at night. Uh, but I'm very fortunate. Um, I know there are very capable people on the inside, and it's not my job anymore. So I sleep pretty well at night knowing that there are good people on the inside manning the, manning the gates. Phil, so you probably make a point of not getting up before 7.30 on any given morning. I but wake what, up at 4.30. What, <laughs> what, would, what troubles you most as someone who's been in the trenches and has now stepped aside? I worry about American culture. I don't think terrorism's a big problem for this country. I mean, there are a lot of other issues like, like uh, education for young children that I think are far more important for America, not just because I'm sort of a pie-in-the-sky guy, but if you look at statistics, for example, on who goes into prisons in America, it's uneducated people. I mean, terrorism is a relatively modest problem. What I worry about in my small area of terrorism, though, is I watch people, and I get hate mail sometimes when I go on Fox or CNN about what I say. I watch people and how they react to events in this country. For example, from immigrant communities, from people who are brown, from people who are black, and I start to occasionally to see a sense that there are Americans who were born here and there are other people who took an oath, but they're not real Americans. I don't like this. Not only as a practitioner, because 
again, this sounds Pollyannish, but the absorptive nature of American culture, when, for example, a Korean American or an African American, a, 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 somebody coming directly from Africa, can believe in the American dream, that means that person's not gonna be extremist. But as soon as they look and say, well, I'm, I'm not really a real American, and I see this sometimes in this country as a result of the past 13 years. I'm not saying as a result of what the government does. I'm saying as a result of people looking out saying, I'm nervous about that guy next to me in the subway. That's fine. But if you start to say that there's real Americans and fake Americans, that's a problem. And I don't like it. Okay. Juan Zarate, Phil Mudd, thank you so thank much you very for a very stimulating Appreciate and very good presentation. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we are going to make Phil Mudd stay. So, uh, Laura, close that door back there and sign books. And uh, again, thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a good rest of your evening. Thank you.